when Bob was working on his first opera, when it was being produced, his first opera was He Who Gets Slapped, uh, he and his librettist, Bernard Stambler, were looking for their next collaborative production. And they were researching material, uh, a good drama to set. And it just so happened, it was 1959, and a remounting of Arthur Miller's play, The Crucible, was being done off-Broadway. And Bob Ward had never seen it before. So he decided, well, it's about time I go see this, this play, because he had heard so much about it when it came out originally. Uh, he went to see it, and he was immediately taken with the dramatic impact of it. And he thought, well, this will be great uh, set as an opera. Uh, so they, he then went about the process of trying to discover what he could do to get the rights to be able to do this. And he contacted Arthur Miller and Arthur Miller's agent, Kay Brown, uh, at that time. And uh, they went through a lot of legal wranglings to finally get the, uh, the approval to do it. And uh, that's basically how it came about, uh, was he was immediately taken with, with the play itself and the dramatic possibilities, the operatic possibilities inherent in the play. He thought the play itself was very musical, the way it was constructed. And he thought it would make a great transfer into opera. And Arthur Miller apparently agreed very much with that opinion because he immediately gave Bob Ward the rights when he asked for them. That's what my dissertation and eventually a book I've written on the subject is all about, how the whole compositional process came about. Uh, and this is what I referred to earlier when I was talking about his compositional process and what makes him so unique as a composer. The way Bob Ward sets texts is that, especially when he was writing opera, is that he would ask his librettist to provide him with text on a typed page, triple spaced. He would then, he, Bob Ward, would then take that text and read it out loud as if he were an actor reciting these lines. And he would read it in different ways, changing the vocal inflections and so on and so forth, until he found just the right reading that he thought was the best dramatically. That would then become the melodic curve that he would follow, the up and down vocal inflections of the dramatic reading. What he would then do was take a pencil and then very lightly above each syllable he would write uh, a rhythmic notation, quarter note, eighth note, sixteenth notes, triplets, whatever, based on the scansion of the text. And this is what I meant earlier by uh, how he integrates text in music. The music is actually derived from those two features, the up and down vocal inflections becoming the melodic curve and the scansion of the text, the rhythmic notations, becoming the rhythmic model for what he would then compose as the finished product. So that's his procedure for writing dramatic music, especially in the Crucible. And he did this extremely, very much on a conscious level, uh, not something intuitive that just happened to come about sporadically. This is a very consistent procedure for him. And that's not to say he does it in a pedantic fashion. Uh, uh, Bob Ward's music is extremely melodic oriented. Uh, so it, it would be impossible for him to write pedantic sounding music. But this procedure is what allows him to work uh, from something that is a model. And then he goes from there. Bob Ward's musical influences were many, both classical and jazz, as he went through the army and those experiences. Uh, which you see, I think, mostly from a musicological standpoint, what I've always noticed about his music in terms of its relationship to jazz influences was the rhythm, the vitality of the rhythms in which he infuses his music. Uh, that's another thing I think that makes him uh, very much different than a lot of American composers. Bob Ward's rhythms are never something you can say, this is always going to happen. It's constantly changing to fit either the text or the mood or the moment. And that's very unique. And I think that that sort of spontaneity sounding uh, music comes from something like jazz. I think more so that after he got uh, inculcated with jazz and, and all of its features, that that became a more consistent feature of his music. His earlier works, uh, I think, are more along the lines of classical constructions, 
when he discovered jazz and started writing in that medium during the war years, I think that was something that really infused his music with something new, something his own at that point. Uh, I would describe it as totally unique, not something you expect to hear. When you listen to Wagner or Verdi or Puccini, there's a very consistent style there that you can expect to hear all the time. With Bob Ward, there's also a consistent Ward style, but it's so ever-changing, to, again, to fit the moment, to fit the mood, that you can't listen to and say, I know what's going to happen next. You're always pleasantly surprised with what you're going to hear. What surprised me the most, what surprised me the most was how much it was always fascinating to me. When you work on a doctoral dissertation or write a book, it's oftentimes uh, happens that after three or four years, you get tired of the subject. It never was the case with, with Bob Ward's music or especially the Crucible. There was always something new and fascinating, a new aspect that I hadn't thought about before. Uh, and to this day, I'm still discovering things in the score that I hadn't seen before. And I, again, I think that's because Bob Ward's music is not something you can say, it's always going to happen in this way. It's always something new and fresh. Bob Ward's music, um, again, it, it's so unique. Uh, I believe that The Crucible, if I'm not mistaken, is the most often produced American opera worldwide. So I, from just having said that, uh, his impact is enormous. His uh, opera, The Crucible, and a few others have been done in just about every continent on the planet. That's fairly unique for most American composers. So I think Bob Ward's legacy is, is enormous. Bob Ward is, is probably one of the most significant people in the world of music in North Carolina. He's, he's been in the state since the 60s. And he has brought more types of music, theater, opera, symphony, chamber music, to not only the eastern North Carolina region, but statewide. As you know, he was chancellor of, of the North Carolina School of the Arts in the 60s and 70s. And he brought with him uh, a whole new world of music to North Carolina. Having come from New York and that in whole atmosphere, he brought much of that with him. So North Carolina has benefited for decades from what Bob Ward has contributed and continues to do so. Bob Ward is one of the most uh, gentlemanly per people I've ever met. He is of the old school of gentlemen. He's always kind, always pleasant. Uh, when I first met him, it was on the telephone, of course, and he immediately invited me to come down from the University of Maryland to meet with him, to begin working with him on my dissertation and eventually the book. And he's always been that way with me and with everybody. Uh, I live in this area now and I see Bob Ward on a regular basis and he is always a kindly, personable gentleman. His personality, um, he, he has a sense of humor that I don't think most people are ready for. Uh, I'll tell you a funny story if you'd like. It's, it, it's probably the most interesting story about how his personality works. When I first started researching Bob Ward and his music as a doctoral candidate, the first thing a student does is go to the Grove Dictionary of Music, of course, the most authoritative source in music. And I did that, and the article began by saying Robert Ward, born Cleveland, Ohio, 1917, died 1998. And I thought to myself, well, darn, I've just missed being able to speak to this man. But I'll, I'll plug away and see what I can come up with anyway. And I continue doing research. Then I ran into a bunch of uh, journal articles that said, Bob Ward appears at such and such a college or such and such a state, 2000, 2001. And I thought, well, there's something wrong here because Grove couldn't possibly be wrong. So I decided to look up Bob Ward's address, and I found this address in North Carolina, and I wrote to him and saying, are you the Bob Ward who wrote The Crucible? 
And about a week later, my phone rings, and he said, yeah, I'm the Bob Ward who wrote The Crucible. Why don't you come on down and talk to me? And I did so, and continued to do so for the next couple of years. But I never had the heart to tell him that the most authoritative source in music said he had died. As I got to know him over the years and realized he had a great sense of humor, I finally decided maybe I should tell him this. So one day I just happened to drop it into a conversation. I said, by the way, Bob, do you know that Grove's Dictionary, the most authoritative source in music, says that you're dead? He goes, yeah, I heard that. Isn't that funny? As a matter of fact, I called them and I said, uh, you, you need to correct this. Mr. Ward is, is quite well alive. And if, if you really want to correct this, maybe you should ask someone else, like perhaps me, to write the new article for the next edition, which they've done. Uh, that's a great question. And it refers back to this idea of synthesizing text with music, especially in The Crucible. Arthur Miller was very, very sensitive to creating a type of language in his play that reflected that rugged New England sort of four-square uh, sounding language of the New England pilgrims. When Bob Ward and his librettist Bernard Stambler were writing the libretto for the opera, they of course had to change a lot of the text and compress a lot of text and add new text, but they kept Miller's model for that rugged four-square sound. And in so doing, when Ward then used that type of language as a model for creating the music based on the syntax of that language. That rugged sounding American language gets transferred to the music. That creates a sense of nationalism. And if, as a matter of fact, the subtitle of my book is Creating an American Musical Nationalism. And this is how he does it, by transferring American speech patterns to American musical patterns. And it's perceptible by the audience. And in fact, many critics have noted how American sounding his music is. And I think this is the main reason why. Bob was born in 1917, of course, uh, and his, his family was quite musical. Uh, his mother was a church organist. His uh, father was a businessman, but always encouraged his, his five children to, to do whatever they were interested in, and all of them seemed to have been interested in music. His sisters were pianists and violinists. His, one of his brothers was in the theater. So it was a very artistic atmosphere in his family. And um, he grew up with that ambiance around him, and it was always encouraged by both of his parents. Uh, when he was a student in high school, in junior high school, there were always uh, operettas being produced in the schools of which he took part. He sang in church choirs and so on. Uh, when radio became a, a viable thing, uh, he, his family was always listening to operas on, on the radio. When uh, the Metropolitan Opera would come to Cleveland on an annual visit, they always made sure to take the children to see an opera production. Uh, so he was just inculcated with music everywhere he turned. And this had a great influence on him, I think. It, it's just something that from an early age uh, he lived with and, and from that point on just couldn't live without. He heard everything from symphony concerts to Cleveland Orchestra to opera, Metropolitan Opera Productions, to jazz, early jazz on the radio. Uh, and all of this sound just became a part of what he would eventually be. And he uses all of this in his music, although you can never listen to his music and say, ah, that's Gershwin, or ah, that's Hindemith, or ah, that's Persichetti. It's always Bob Ward, because he filters it through his own uh, processing system as a musician. Again, his music is very unique in that respect. No, I, I would not classify Bob Ward as a rebel, and nor do I think he would classify himself as a rebel. Um, Bob, uh, his main compositional periods were in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, at a time, especially in the academic world, where, where atonal music was the big thing. And Bob never felt that that was very audience-friendly. 
So he always thought, if I'm going to write music, I want my audience to enjoy it. He never cared much for what the critics had to say about his music because the critics didn't come to listen to it as much as audiences do. So when you hear Bob Ward's music, it's always something that you can take home with you and remember. I think in The Crucible, the most significant moment for me, uh, and I tell this to Bob all the time, is the opening of Act Three. When Arthur Miller first wrote his play, The Crucible, uh, it included four acts. And the original producer of the play came to Miller after the premiere of the play and said, you know, it needs something else. You need to have a scene in which John Proctor and um, Elizabeth, no, I'm sorry. You need to have a scene where John Proctor and Abigail Williams have a confrontation. Miller wasn't very happy with the idea of putting this in, but he did so to please his producer. After that initial run of something like 198 performances in 1953, Miller took it out of all subsequent performances and in all subsequent published editions of the play. When Bob Ward first saw The Crucible, the play in 1959, he just happened to see an off-Broadway production of the play with that scene put back in. And he thought it was a very powerful scene. And when he was uh, negotiating with Miller to get the rights to do the opera, he mentioned this to Miller. And Miller said, well, I didn't, I didn't really like that scene too much. And Bob said, no, no, no. That's one of the best scenes in the play. I have to have that in the opera. Miller agreed. Uh, what Bob did was rearrange it. The original scene was at the end of Act Two. Bob and Bernard Stambler thought it would make a more dramatic impact, put at the beginning of Act Three. So that's where they put this scene. It's got some of the most gorgeous music of the whole opera. It's the scene where John Proctor and Abigail meet secretly in the woods. Proctor has come to Abigail to ask her to back off of her accusations, especially against his wife, Elizabeth. It's also the scene where he finds out that Abigail is not a spiteful, vindictive 17-year-old girl. She's actually quite mad. He realizes at that point that trying to appeal to this girl's sense of goodness won't work because she's completely mad. It's the scene where John Proctor realizes that uh, Abigail is mad and that he cannot reason with her. Uh, it's also the probably the one scene in the opera that is the sexiest because initially Abigail tries to seduce John Proctor in this scene and he's having nothing to do with it of course and what Ward did was provide this very lush lascivious sounding music to go along with her amorous intentions. Uh, so I think that's the real highlight at least for me of that opera because it's a real turning point in the drama at that point. Again, this was 1962 when a lot of academics and critics were going to eschewing everything that was tonal and only liking things that were atonal. So you get some, some and they're all in my book, you get some reviews that are wonderful, some that are horrible. Today they're all good, of course. Um, so the, the premiere at, in 61 was this way, it's changed completely since then. So I, I, I didn't want to bring a negative into, or, or possible negative into it, because that's all been dispelled since then, because critics have grown up. <laughs> <laughs> and perhaps Bob Ward was a rebel in that he didn't go along with the trend of going to the 12-tone atonal strictly. Now, he has written some pieces that are atonal and 12-tone, uh, but not all. He still wants his music to have an audience appeal. And it's been my impression that he's always felt that if, if you beat an audience over the head with atonality, it's, they're not going to enjoy it. So he always tries to please his audience first. And in that respect, he probably was a rebel. He sort of bucked the trend at the time even though it might have taken decades for critics to catch up with the fact that atonality was not something that had a lot of audience appeal. Bob is just one of those people that you're, you feel privileged to know. Uh, 
as a musicologist, uh, one of the things I've learned about doing research in music is how fortunate you are if you get to actually speak to the person who wrote the music. If I was interested in Mozart, which I am, I can't talk to Mozart. I, I can't talk to Bach. I love all of that music, but there's a connection when you can actually speak to the person about what he did or she did, how they did it. So as a musicologist, I feel very privileged that I have an association with a person like Bob Ward.